Hello, today is May 13th, 2008. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Libraries Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus, and we are privileged to have with us today Joseph C. Paruti. Welcome, Joe. Thank you. Thanks Thank for coming. May I ask you when and where you were born? I was born in Webster, Mass. in 1925 on January 25th. And where do you currently live? I currently live in Falmouth, on, uh, East Falmouth and Cape Cod. And how long um, have you lived in Falmouth? Well, we've lived there since uh, 1981. And your marital status? Well, I am married and I, I have three children, one of whom has deceased. and. Uh, he was still one of our big favorites. Any grandchildren? Yes, we have three grandchildren. They're all girls. Uh, we have twins who are 28. They turned 28 yesterday. And we have a, our youngest granddaughter who is, will be 21 in June. Um, and although she's the uh, uh, baby of the family, she also happens to be six feet and a half inch tall. My goodness, does she get her height from you? Well, no, I think, I think probably from, uh, from her mother's family because one of her uncles is six foot seven. Oh my, yeah. yeah. And did you graduate in the Webster area from Webster or where did you graduate no, from? No, when I was two years old, my uh, father and mother moved to North Chelmsford and I was raised there um, and uh, eventually I got married and my wife and I lived in Lowell and then moved to Chelmsford and then eventually as time went on we moved to several places and eventually ended up in Falmouth. When and where, where did you enter the military? Uh, we, I entered the military and I believe it was around June 15th in 1943 and it was at uh, 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 I think it's Fort Devens. And why did you go in? Well, there was the we had uh, the United States had just entered the uh, World War uh, with the war against Germany, and and uh, and we'd had the uh, uh, horrific bombing at Pearl Harbor, and so they were in the process of drafting people, and they did allow you to to volunteer as opposed to kind of like joining but not really uh, going out and signing a, initial papers. And uh, they would then take and send you, uh, test you and send you out to different places and, and that's how I happened to join. How old were you at that time? I believe I was um, 18, years, 18 years and six months. Were you out of high school? Yes. I just finished uh, my first year of college. And where were you at college? At Boston College. Did a lot of your friends also join at that time? Yes, there were, there were six of us who went to Boston College together who were all joined. Um, uh, one went to the Marines, one went to the Navy. Um, two others, myself and two others, went to the Army and I eventually ended up in the Air Force. Was it called the Army Air Force? Or? Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. Why did you choose the Army initially? Uh, I didn't know anything about it, and it just was uh, convenient. And um, they had a program then known as the Army Specialized Training Group, uh, or program, excuse me, uh, ASTP. And what they did is they, uh, you had to take a, a, an aptitude test and um, if you got a score of more than 120, then they talked to you further about either going on to school for the Army and what have you, you know. So uh, once I, I came up with, I think it was like around 145 and, uh, as a score, so they, I got sent to this group down in uh, Camp Croft, South Carolina. I guess it's now Fort Croft. But, uh, and uh, that was a place where they trained the uh, um, infantry people. Uh, and we had a 22-week basic training course that we had to go through. 
and then they would talk to you about going on to school or what have you. So your basic training was at Camp Croft. Yes. What, do you, what was that like? Do you remember? Well, it was teaching you to be a rifleman or, or whatever. Uh, one of the problems that we had down there, um, that's probably why I went to the Air Force, uh, after about uh, six weeks I became very disenchanted with the infantry uh, and I have, I have a great deal of feeling for them. Uh, so three of my mates and, and myself went into, um, uh, into, into town and when we did there was a, an Air Force recruiting station there. So we went in and took the test to become an air cadet. And of course we all did very well and we all passed. Um, and it was kind of a mistake because then we had to go back and finish the basic training. And <laughs> we of course got all of the really nasty jobs. Because you were leaving. <laughs> right. And, uh, and then eventually we, we reported to uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. And how long were you in Greensboro? Not very long. Maybe, um, I'd say, two or three months, two months at the outside. And while there, what was your specialty for training? We weren't, we weren't really doing anything. We were just there kind of like it was like an entry unit for the Air Force. And what we were trying to do was to, they were trying to determine where we were going to go. And then we went to, uh, we all had to go to a, a college to make sure that everybody had a minimum amount of math background. So what college did you go to? We, well, we thought it was a pretty good uh, deal. We, we were um, about 250 uh, men at the Rock Hill, South Carolina Uni College for Women. And uh, we were very popular. I'll bet. <laughs> How long were you there for? Uh, we were there for uh, about three months. And were you taking math every day? Uh, it, was, it was pretty elementary as far as math was concerned. I had, I had already surpassed whatever, what their requirements were. And it was just everybody had to go to the class, so we did go and we took the tests and the exams and that sort of thing, you know. So they could say that we were qualified to do that. Um, part of the reason for doing the math was that obviously everybody want, would like to be a pilot, but everybody was not going to be one. Mm -hmm. They also needed cadets for bombardiers and also for navigators on the, on the larger aircraft. So uh, you had to take the math and that's the reason for doing it. You also needed the math to, to assist you in, in trying to uh, pick out your routes for if you were a pilot or what have you. And um, we had uh, along about uh, May of 19, no, let's see, no, more like about April of 1944, we um, had 6,000 cadets were washed out and they were offered the opportunity to either go back to the infantry or to stay in the Air Force and become a gunner. Uh, needless to say, I chose to become a gunner. And were you, did you continue to be stationed in North Carolina, or were you? No, we were, we were transferred to, um, I think it was McDill Air Base in Florida. And um, we, we then went to uh, Omaha, Nebraska for, for training as gunners. Um, it was a 29, B-29 base there. And, um, Along the way, we had uh, we we uh, developed some very strong bonds. This entire unit, believe it or not, everybody in our unit that was that I the unit that I was with um, had from six months to uh, eighteen months experience. We had uh, three people who had been um, to Europe as an infantryman and finished their tour of duty and came back to the States and then took the Air Force exam and, and came in. They wanted to go back yeah. in a different... They wanted to, go, wanted to get, get out of the infantry. And, and do something different. Yeah, right. Um, how many were in your unit? There were, uh, 
in, in the unit that, that I first went in with, there were, um, uh, I believe it was uh, two platoons, which would be someplace in the vicinity of like 80 or 90. Were any the original group from BC, or had they all gone elsewhere? No, the, the original group, all, we all went to different places, you know, for training and so forth. And um, w one of the, the things I, I have to say, you know, I have a great deal of admiration for the, um, uh, the, 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 the people who are in the infantry because they're really the soul of, the, of, of any of our military. I mean, they do all of the really dirty work. They, they, do, they have terrible situations and so on. And um, unbeknownst to us, when we went into this program, we were offered the opportunity like to, like to either study languages or study engineering. And I have a better proclivity for, uh, for math than I do for languages. So um, I kept trying to get to be an engineer, but they wanted us to study languages. And if you didn't take their, their uh, offer, then what they did, I found out later, because they took all of the people who, who were six feet and over, they had us right face, two steps, left face, and they dismissed the rest of the people. And there were, um, I think, something like in my infantry, the infantry uh, uh, group that I was with, they were, uh, they were I think, um, 240 men. And Forty of the people who were there became the rangers who went into Anzio, of which 1,598 went in mm. and 98 came up. Mm. So I figured I became a kind of a fatalist and I decided it wasn't my time to go and it was mm -hmm. better that I got out. Mm -hmm. So then I went, we went into like to gunnery training and then we, after we finished the gunnery training, we then went into, uh, were assigned to a crew and um, we were transferred to Alamogordo, New Mexico. And how long were you there? Well, I was there a long time because the crew originally was made up of five officers and six enlisted men. And eventually it got changed to one of the enlisted men got changed to being an officer. It was a, it was a radar uh, gunner and um, I, I don't know what, exactly what his purpose was, but anyhow, somebody, one of the enlisted people had to leave the, uh, leave the Air Force, leave the, the group that was going overseas at that time. <coughs> and uh, so <coughs> I was the, the one who got dropped off of our crew, and so I went back and went through all of the training again for another, another four months. Or With so. another crew? With another crew. And that was the crew I went overseas with. Did you have a name for yourselves, or? No, we were, we were just, we were part of the 39th Bond Group. The, the, the big thing that, uh, big thing that, that happened to us while we were there was that uh, the Enola Gay was, was doing their training, and people say, oh really, did you ever get to see it or anything? Well, you could not get within a mile of the Enola Gay. It was that secretive. Oh. Well, nobody knew what they were doing. I mean, we, all we knew was they had this one plane and they would take off. I mean, they were like in a cubicle. They were isolated from everybody. And, and now, back up a little bit. Yeah. You were with a new crew with the 39th Bomb Group. That was my second crew. And yeah. where yeah. did you go? We, went, we were in Almagordo. They, that's where all okay. of the crews, most of the crews trained. And was the Enola Gay there also? Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. All right. One of the things, one of the training things that we had to do in 29s, because the B-29 was, I think, specifically designed to um, fight the war in Japan for doing really long distances. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been to Europe, but like, for example, like to go, the, the B-17s were based in, in England uh, or Scotland, you know, in, in that area, and they would have a long flight, round trip, like about 400 miles, mm -hmm. like going to, from Boston to Washington, D.C., mm. okay? <laughs> Our round trip was 3,300 miles My gosh. from Guam to Tokyo or any parts of Japan. So, so back up again. Yeah, yeah. You're in New Mexico. Yeah. So 
how long, you said you were there for a while, how long was Well, that? I was there for about eight months. Eight months. Yeah, well, each, each training session was about four months long. Um, one of the things that, we, that you did while you were there, you, you, the crew got together and you had to learn how to use the equipment on the aircraft, you know, they had special um, gunnery sites and so forth. It was like the first time that they used an electronic gunnery sight and what you, what you did is you took and you, you had like a circle of stars and you tried to get, you could adjust the stars up, down, and wide or and open and close it. You tried to get the plane that you were shooting at um, in this circle and get the circle as tight as you could without, you know, and keeping the entire aircraft inside that. And if you did, you could hit them uh, about 94% of the time, 94% of the bullets that were fired would hit the aircraft at a thousand yards. So what happened is that the fighter planes had to, um, had to take and come in and the closest they, the first time they could shoot at your aircraft, they had to go through 600 yards of fire. So what they did is they had to get you used to doing this and the other part of it was that unlike most of the, the aircraft, I didn't have my own gun. We had four turrets on the B-29 and what we did is we had a top gunner, we had the, the bombardier who was actually a gunner too, and we had the left and right blister gunner and a tail gunner. And what you had to do is you had to take and switch the turrets from like if you were being attacked from two sides, you had to have one from the top that would be going to the right and the one from the bottom be going to the left, you know. And you had to also be careful that you didn't try and shoot. They had mechanisms that, that kept you from shooting parts of your own aircraft off. Sure. So that you could take and switch these things. And so we had to train on all of that stuff. And then, uh, so we, we would go and we'd fly these missions and, and uh, uh, we'd, we'd like fly down to Cuba from, Mex from New Mexico and back. <laughs> and we had to get used to high altitude flying and it was the first pressurized uh, warplane. And uh, it, was, uh, it, it was quite an, ex quite an experience, you know. And so we were, um, we, we just really thought it was, hey, it was great sport, you know, because there was nobody shooting back at us initially at when we were doing time. the training. What was your rank at that point? Oh, I was a PFC. <laughs> yeah. So did you think you were going to Europe or to the Pacific? No, or we knew we were going to the Pacific because they, the, war, the uh, B-17s and the people with the B-24s did a marvelous job and they had, um, they had taken care of everything in the Germany. Germany was about ready to, to cash it in. Um, the, one, of the, one of the things that happened along the way is that, um, you, you know, we had another strange thing that happened to me that, you know, we, like I told you, my pilot was the type of person, he got everybody together in the crew and told us that, um, that when we went there, his feeling was that if we flew 3,300 miles, we were not, no matter what our condition was, we we're going to drop the bombs on the target. We might not come out of it, but by God, that's what they're paying us to do. You know, so, yeah, we are, yeah, the boy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was 19, what the hell did I know? Sure, sure. So anyhow, we, we, uh, we did, we, so everybody on the crew felt this way. And um, so when we, we, we started going out, and um, uh, I was kind of a goof off, I guess, or something. Anyhow, I missed part of the gunnery training, uh, the film gunnery training. And so they had a, a, an aircraft that was going to be flying with all people who had to make up because they were sick or whatever. And uh, so I was supposed, they had two planes that were going to go up and we were doing these practice gunnery missions. Mm -hmm. And so I was supposed to fly in plane number one. And as I'm going out to the line, I met, saw this friend of mine that I had been in cadets with and, and so forth. And so I was talking with him and I went over to the pilot of plane number one and said, Sir, would you mind if I did my gunnery exercise in plane number two because um, because this friend of mine is here and I haven't seen him like in four months or something like this here. And he said, I don't care where you fly. He said, just so long as you make sure you get the gunnery done. I said, okay. So I go off and we take off and we completed the gunnery stuff and we were having a grand chat and so forth. Plane number one is coming in for a landing. 
We put the flaps down, put the landing gear down, blew up. Really? Yeah. And of course, nobody got out of the plane. And um, so our pilot and the crew is standing there, you know, and they're like, you know, the pilot's got to take and write a letter. He's thinking to my parents and so forth. And I came up behind him and said, said, wow, Captain, did you, did you see that? And he turned around and said, weren't you supposed to be on that plane? And I said, yeah. So he says, stand at attention. He starts reading me the riot act. And, you know, so I'm like this because the wind's blowing and the sand's going in my eyes. He said, turn around. So he now had the stuff going in his eyes. He's got a smile from ear to ear, giving me hell because I disobeyed orders. I was supposed to be in plane one and I didn't go. And How did the, you feel about that, though, knowing that this was... I just figured it wasn't my time. Mm -hmm. So that the rest of the time we were, we were flying, so whatever the, the pilot said to do, I thought was, was great, you know, and he had, and he, he really was, he was a, was a real piece of work, you know, and. Uh, so this was happening, did this happen in New Mexico or over? Yes. It did, yeah. okay. Yeah. So you were a pretty tight-knit group. Yes. And from mm -hmm. New Mexico, did we, you go we, to Guam? Yeah, we, went, we, we got a new, uh, we got a brand new B-29, and we thought, wow, isn't this great? It was the first, first B-29 that had, instead of having hydraulic uh, worm gears to, to take and open up the bomb bay doors, this thing here had a, like a hydraulic thing, and it would just go, Choo! they'd open up like with one big snap, you know? Sure. <laughs> and, uh, so it was top of the line. Oh, yeah. We said, hey, that's terrific, you know? So we flew out to Bakersfield, California, and then to to Hawaii, and then, then to um, Kwajalein, and then from Kwajalein to Guam. And that yeah. was going to be your base? Yeah, that was mm -hmm. going to be our base. And we got there, and it's like, you know, the, uh, the group, we were assigned to the 39th bomb group, and the bomb group commander said, it's like said to the pilot, okay, give me the keys to the, the new convertible. <laughs> and we ended up having the oldest plane in the 20th Air Force. Oh, you didn't get to keep the brand new one? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, so you had to trade it in, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and as you indicated, we were a very tightly knit group. And um, we had, um, you know, like when we, we eventually got, like, I don't know, like in five or six days, we got to fly our first mission. So we go out to meet our ground crew, and of course our crew chief is a, is a corporal. He was, uh, had been a master sergeant three or four times and got busted. I, I don't know what. He had been in Guam for uh, 37 months, and the assistant crew chief had just made corporal. And then we had all PFCs or privates for the rest of the people on the thing. So Were they knowledgeable? About oh, they were extremely, we, we wouldn't have traded them for a general, so I'll tell you, they had, these guys were really great. So the, the pilot, this is why, you know, like, if I sound like I'm in love with the pilot, I was, because he... Are you at liberty to say what his name was? Yes, his name was William Brooks, and he was from Portland, Maine. And he, he was, you know, if, if you had to go to combat with somebody, I mean, he was the guy you wanted to be, be there, because there was no nonsense about him, you know. And... Uh, so he, we flew our first mission and we came back, you know, and it didn't look like anything uh, uh, exciting. And then we, you know, we started walking around the airplane, there were 169 holes in the, in the aircraft from the flak that we had just flown through. And did you not realize at the time that you were hit? You couldn't, e you couldn't even feel it and because the 29 was such a large vehicle that, it, you know, it just... I mean, the holes, I mean, I'm not talking about, you know, gigantic holes. They're like holes like about two, three inches, you know. But it was like flak, you know, it was, what is it? It's a shell that goes over and it, just, and it bursts open. And then you get these small metal pieces and they fly all over, you know. And they can cause a great deal of damage. So your first mission, which you thought was pretty, pretty easy, yeah. once you saw all those holes, what did you think then? We didn't. We didn't know what to think. We thought. We thought. So the pilot, of course, when we come back, he said, told the crew chief that he said, you know, if you could give us like about four or five hours, we'll come back and help you clean up the aircraft, you know, and so forth. And the crew chief said, no, 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 that's, that's okay. He said, no, no. He said, we dirtied it. We'll we'll help you clean it up. 
So that developed a really close netness between the ground crew and the air crew. And these guys here, you know, uh, were, were really great. I mean, they were good, really good me mechanics and, and, and stuff like that. And so we used to take, and we found out like along the way, like shortly after that, one of the guys said something about, well, you guys are lucky. You guys get a, get a real egg every time you complete a mission. I said, oh, when did you have your last real egg? And the guy said, let's see, I think it was 32 months ago. So we got together, the air crew, and we decided that when we came back, there were six men on the ground crew. So we decided that six of us would not take an egg when we went on a mission. And the air crew got a, every mission we completed, the air crew, uh, the ground crew got a, a, got an real egg, eggs. a real egg. And these guys, so, I mean, you know, I mean, that's like, I don't know what, you, it's like something that's unmentionable. It's to sure. trying to think of what it is that, that, that these guys, they, so these guys are really close to us. They used to come over and they'd visit us. And, you know, we lived in different areas and different quantities. We played cards together. We did I everything. was going to ask you about that. On your off time, yeah. you rested and relaxed and played cards. Yeah, and they, had, yeah they had, like, movies, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, How they, often did you have to go on missions? Well, we did um, uh, 17 missions in, uh, I think it was, like, uh, five five weeks and three days, something like that. So we were clicking them off at about uh, three, three, um, three missions a week. And you, when you talk about the four turrets, yeah. where were you in the airplane? I was, a, I was a blister gunner, one of the left gunner. And yeah. close calls? Oh yeah. Well, we had we had a number of things. My other job, everybody had multiple jobs. One of my jobs was I had to clear the bomb bays, the rear bomb bay, okay, and somebody else cleared the front bomb bay. Now, what happened is that sometimes is when you're going on one of these long flights, the the shackles or the mechanism that holds the bombs on. We were using 500 pound bombs. They would be the GPs or fire bombs, and they would take and be fastened to the bomb rack. And there was a thing, a thing that was supposed to be like, like a handcuff almost, you know, and it was so they could move a little bit. But anyhow, sometimes the shackle didn't open, and the bomb didn't go out. So when the bomb didn't go out, it was my job to go out into the bomb bay, and free the shackle so that the bomb could drop out. Now, uh, we had so what would happen is. They had very strict rules as to what you were supposed to do. Now, when I went out to, to clear the bomb bay of these bombs, I was supposed to wear my parachute with me because if I happened to slip and I fell out the bomb bay, I'd have, I'd have a parachute on which I could, you know, release and hopefully land safely. Well, I got out in the bomb bay. I have to tell you, as you can see, I'm the large economy size, so I got out in How the How tall are you? Six feet, yeah. But in uh, any event, they had, uh, when we were out there, you get this back parachute, or if you don't have a back one, you have a front one, which means you're trying to get out there and trying to get at this garium shackle, and so you can't do it. So after the second, about the second time I went in, I went back into the compartment like this and dropped my parachute in there, went back out there, and we used to crawl all over the garium place, you know, with, with no parachutes, strictly in violation, you know. Of, of orders, but in any event, they, but it was the only way that you could get these things done. So um, we, we, went, we went there and, you know, we got, felt kind of bad about it because of the four, first 17 missions we flew, 14 times we came back with three engines or less. Wow. So the, when, we, when we were coming, when, when we were doing this, while we were doing this stuff here, the ground crew, you know, we'd be out there helping them and so forth. And, so the pilot was, uh, like I said, he's a real piece of work. He, was, he, would, he went out and we were talking with the people, you know, and they said, boy, you know, I wish we were in the Navy. I said, why, you know, they get, they get real ice cream. I said, no kidding, yeah. So the pilot goes over and we had, uh, it's like, almost like men and mash, you know, they said, this, we had this latrine orderly, and I won't mention his name, but he was from New Jersey. And anything you wanted, he could get by it. At a cost. Yeah. And he also had a 
had a little Las Vegas area. And uh, he, uh, the net result was that, you know, he went over and said, he, the pilot went over to him and that said, asked him if he would see if he could get us a, one of these hand crank ice cream makers. You remember like the old tub and you put the ice in it and you... Yeah, crank it up. So, so he said, so he said, oh, gee, I, you know, I, I don't know if I can get one. He said, come on, I, I want you to get that for me. So he said, okay. So he did, he came back. And he said, well, where's the rest of the stuff? The pilot. And, and the latrine oddly says, well, you just told me you wanted the ice cream maker. He says, well, what good is that if I don't have anything to work with it? So he said, oh, okay. So he went out and someplace he secured um, a big tub of this ice cream powder. You mix it with water and it made fake cream, you know, and so forth. So of course, you know, it had all kinds of flavor. You had all, whatever the, whatever kind of water you had, that's what it did. So we found out that we could get a hold of some large cans of uh, fruit, you know, like peaches or pears or fruit cocktail. So we would take and we would use the juice and so forth for part of the water that we made and we'd make this ice cream. And so these guys here, you know, they thought they had died and gone to heaven because they, every time we come back from mission, then we'd clean up the aircraft and we'd all sit there and we'd crank the thing. The pilot would come up with a big chunk of ice and we'd chip it, you know. So it, it was, I mean, it was as close as you could be. These guys were, became so dedicated to us that they would not let anybody fly the airplane excepting us. And it was the same crew, ground yeah. crew that yeah. you would always have. So not yeah. only were you yeah. tight with your yeah. your crew, your right. aircraft crew, right. but also your ground right. crew. When you talk about this, the thirty, the uh, the, the B twenty nine. Yeah. Uh, many of us see at times that there were names to them. Yeah. Did you name your plane? Uh, we named it twice. Tell us about that. Okay. Um, initially. We, we, had, uh, we had taken a vote and we had, uh, I don't know whether somebody had a, a, a girlfriend or what, but anyhow, we had, had, a, uh, had, had this uh, red-headed lady um, uh, who could have been doing a Victoria's Secret commercial and, uh, well, I don't think she had quite that much clothing, but anyhow, <laughs> uh, we put it on and we had an inspection one time and the uh, wing commander came by and he wanted us to put clothes on it. And so we all got together and we said, no, we're not going to do it. So what we did is we left part of the thing on there and we put, just had a thing painted on the aircraft that said censored. So the name was censored. <laughs> well, then we had to take the rest of the stuff off, just leave the label on, that became the name of the plane. That's great. And, yeah. Now, when you talk about your missions, did yeah. you keep track of hits that you made? Well, you know, we, we, we were lucky. The only time you really ran into any, anything like that was like if you were flying daylight missions when the, the Japanese aircraft would be there. And to be honest with you, that when you, when you went out there towards the end of the war, they were just putting on a show for the people down below. And we, we went up one time and, and we hit one, of the one daylight mission that we went on, somebody came in. They, they tried to made a couple of passes at our at our airplane, and um, and I got one, and the tail gunner got one, and then um, we went on another daylight mission, and the guy tried to come up from underneath, and, and I happened to see him, and you know when we, and before the guy got to the aircraft, he was he was gone, and um, so I ended up with two of them. Uh, and we had four, I think at, by four at the end of the thing we were like around six or something that we had. And it was, it was due to the, like the, uh, um, due to the gun turrets and the gun system that they had devised for this aircraft. And it was, it was really, a, it was a great airplane, I'm telling you. When you were, fir when you, f after the first mission yeah. where you didn't realize yeah. that you were hit by flak, did you have missions where you came back that you really felt like you had many lives because of a close call or anything uh, like that. Well, we had, yeah, we had we had a number of them, a couple of them like that, but um, we had um, we did fly. We, one time when we were flying, um, we had 
uh, we came to realize how serious the flack was because uh, we had like, <laughs> we, for safety reasons or something, for some reason, I guess that was the way they designed it, the, the gunner's positions, we were sitting with our back, sitting looking backwards, if you would. Um, and, and so when we were sitting there, we got hit by a piece of flak, and it came up under my seat, went in back of the seat, went through the, um, the pressurized area, into the, into the bomb bay, and there was a transfer hose where we transferred gasoline from like the center tank to the wing tanks or from the wing tanks to one to the other, you know, to keep the plane balanced and that sort of thing. And it severed the transfer hose. So, of course, you know, as you know, like what happened is the gasoline all started pouring out. So the, the sequence went something like this. Uh, gun at the pilot. Uh, Sir, we're smelling gasoline back here. He said, yes, I'm smelling it too. And then all of a sudden the radio operator goes on and says that uh, P-42 has, has indicated that we're on fire. So we're expecting the whole thing to go kaboom. And what was happening was the gas was filled the bomb bay and it was coming out and it looked like smoke. <laughs> but we couldn't open the bomb bay to get rid of all of this stuff because if we did, we had the electronic bomb bay doors with the worm gears. Mm -hmm. So all you needed was a spark and we were gone. So we had to sit there and let all of this gasoline, so we tried to, we couldn't even transfer gasoline or what have you. So, um, you know, we came back and, and when, when I took a look, in back of my seat there was a hole that was like about that big. And it came up through there, went through the pressurized uh, wall into the bomb bay and there was a dent Oh, maybe a two or three inch dent in the bomb in one of the bomb racks, you know. That uh, so you know we came to realize that you know flak was pretty pretty serious. I mean you didn't feel it like when you were there, and but it, it could do things like that too, you know. Um, along about this time, we we also got got grounded by the wing commander because if we continued at the rate we were going, we would have finished our tour of duty um, in less than uh, what, about four, four, four months and, uh, and two weeks or something like that. And we would not have gotten credit for being overseas. So you had to kind of slow down? Yeah, so they, they grounded us. We couldn't fly any combat missions. So we used to, you know, the new crews that came over, we would take and train them. Mm -hmm. And we were flying like these missions. We were going to the Rikiu Islands which were only 13 hours away instead of 15. <laughs> and now, g backing up a minute, yeah. when you were flying these missions, yeah. you were flying out of Guam, yeah. and where would you go? Close to? Well, we would go, we'd go to Tokyo, we'd go mm -hmm. to Nagoya, uh, to um, uh, oh, mo mostly in those areas, in the industrial areas, you know, like in the in southern, uh, Japan. And so when you um, were basically in combat, yeah. it was over Japan or near mm. Japan? It was always on Japan, Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Rikyu Islands, what they, what they did is they had uh, uh, come up with a plan for the Pacific where instead of you know trying to take Island A and going to Island B and going to C and so forth, they said, okay, we took Island A, and then they skipped over to Island D, and they just took and cut everything off between A and D. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not quite that simple, there's a lot, thousands of men, you know, and ships and so forth. But they, they took and they had these the Japanese people, they were still alive, they weren't killing them or anything like this, but they, they didn't have any food, they didn't have any ammunition, and, you know, so we would go and bomb the Rikyu Islands, and, and what we used to do was to drop, drop flower bombs. And what are flower bombs? They're like big bags of flour, okay. you know, like the white that you use to make bread and stuff like this. So when we'd go over there, the, all of a sudden we'd be flying and they always made sure they flew over the runway. And you'd see these little Japanese men down there and they're throwing rocks and they're shaking their foot. They didn't have anything to shoot at, you know. And you take and you drop it. The, the, the bag of flour would hit the, hit the runway and of course it would burst. And all of a sudden you see about four or five people, they come out and they had like 
dust pans and, and everything, picking up the flour because that's the only yes. way they could get to make bread and make stuff bread like this. Food. And I, although nobody ever said that that was their plan, you know, it was pretty obvious since we were going down the runway and dropping it in a place where there was no vegetation or anything like that, that you're trying to keep them alive. Multi-purpose. Yeah. While this was all going on, were you hearing anything about the Enola Gay or any other flight plans? Yes. What were you hearing? Well, we had, um, when we, heard, we, well, we would, of course, we would get the stuff like over the radios or what have you, and, and what would happen is that they, they, they weren't talking about, about the fact that the Enola Gay was going to come over and they were going to do this thing here. Um, I think if you wanted to find out the history of that, you need to look. I think there's a movie or something that they made on this thing here. Probably. But did you know that that this was the Enola Gay was on Tinian, okay. and and mm -hmm. so what so what happened was that when they eventually they were going out to uh, to do their first run uh, to uh, what was it Nagoya was one of them, but anyhow they. When they were going out to do their first run, they had uh, uh, they went out and they dropped the bomb, and we're, we're sitting there saying, well, "Wait a minute, that, that doesn't sound right. That, like this one bomb did more damage than our whole wing would do on one bombing mission." Was was unbelievable. So you really didn't know until we, it we didn't we didn't know didn't know what was what was happening okay. with this thing. Well, then they kind of had us slow down to, they decided they were going to slow down because they were going to give them a chance to, for the Japanese to, uh, to concede defeat. So what they did was they had us fly over to Tinian and we loaded up with 40,000 pounds of food and clothing and so forth and um, we uh, had to fly back to Guam. Well, what we had to do was we had to fly with very low gas tanks, you know, with practically no fuel in the tanks, because we had to make up for it. When we landed at Guam, we blew two tires. Now, that's that's bad, but it's not not fatal because on the landing gear we had uh, two trucks with four huge tires each, and we blew one tire in each one of the trucks, you know, and they came back. Now, of course. Our ground crew would hear nothing of this. They immediately changed all the tires. Mm -hmm. They went because they, I mean that's why they were they were great. They 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 had like every maintenance record in in the 20th Air Force, I think you know. And uh, anyhow, they would hear nothing of it. But they had the if one tire blew, they were going to take a chance with one one of the others blowing or what have you. So they just took and they changed all the tires and everything. And we had to then take off and fly. And we were flying this what was called a POW mission, it was not a combat mission. And they had prisoners of war, and then this prison camp was 285 miles northwest of Tokyo. Now when you say they had POWs? The Japanese. Okay, so they had Americans American and, and British? Yeah, or, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so they had, it was 285 miles northwest of, of Tokyo, and a fail-safe landing, in case we got any damage or something, was Vladivostok, Russia. Oh. <laughs> and, and of course, it was, it, was a, it was like a bloody riot, you know. They, it, when we first went up there, we, we went over and we, you know, dropped these, these pallets of food with, you know, like when they, you see people, like when they're dropping a, a Jeep or something, or, you know, or big things. They drop these big pallets with all full of food and so forth, and they with parachutes on them, and they go down and they land. Now, I don't know who the hell was getting the food. I we were hoping that the American uh, GIs were getting it, but anyhow, they we dropped them and we came back. And one of the things we found out when we were going along, when they opened the bomb bay doors, people were scattering all over the place because um, they, you know, we were at low levels, we weren't going to take and start dropping this stuff at high altitude. So anyway, they, they do it. So we thought that was kind of hilarious. So we'd go over, as we're flying back, we're continuing along like this, and all of a sudden, they, they tell a bombardier to open the bomb bay doors. They'd open the doors, and we're laughing like hell because the people were all scattering. We didn't have anything to drop. You know? <laughs> it was sick. But, any, but anyway. It, it, 
Yeah. It, it, it probably lightened up a yeah. very tense yeah. couple of moments. Yeah. Right. It was. It was. Yeah. You know, something that was. You know. We thought was great. They had. When you went on your missions, you mentioned a couple of day missions. Yeah. Did you go on any night missions? Most of our missions were night missions. All the firebomb missions were at night. What was that like? Well, it was the firebomb missions were <coughs> um, were not nearly as dangerous, but they had some exciting moments that occurred because um, along the way, uh, uh, our pilot, although we thought he was great, was not exactly in good standing with the uh, w with the wing commander. Um, because he was a risk taker, or why? Yeah, no, because he well. Uh, let me tell you a couple of little stories about him. Like, for example, we flew over. We flew over with our new aircraft, and we landed, say, on a Thursday. And on Monday, he put everybody in the crew in for promotion. And the wing commander said, "You haven't done anything yet." He said, "Well, they've been working like hell all all this time to get him. Look at their ranks and so forth." So they denied it, you know. So. He went back, and, and then of course the next thing he did was he get we start getting the, the ground crew coming in to eat with us and, and so forth, and that was I guess kind of a no-no or something. But anyway, so w things were going along, and, and um, he uh, he was kind of he had his own ideas about what things should be done and, and that sort of thing. And, and what so, was his ranking? Uh, he was a uh, first lieutenant when he went over. And I'm not certain if he was a first lieutenant or second lieutenant when he came back, but in any event, he, he, uh, so he went along. So one night we were going up and we were bombing Tokyo, and you have, in order to get to Tokyo, you had to go up this long bay. It's like about 60 miles long or something. And so what would happen is so that the bombardier wouldn't get jolted or anything. What they would do is when you started up, you get like about 10 miles in, and the bombardier would open up the bomb bay doors so that the, the plane would be steady. You know, it wouldn't be like any rough, if there was any roughness, it would be static so that he could take and adjust for, with his bombs. Well, we're going up the bay and we happen to see this man that we, we knew he had drunk, he used to drink with and, and uh, he's going up there. So we called in over the intercom to tell him that the guy was next door. And as he did, the bomb bay doors opened up, the bombs jettisoned, the guy peeled off and, and came back, and the guy came at, came when we were going in for debriefing. Each, after each mission, we'd all have to sit down and they'd have a debriefing. Well, mm -hmm. what did you see? How did it, did it look like there were a lot of places that were on fire, you know, all this stuff. And so when we were coming back, we had, uh, so this guy comes, comes over and he says, wow, he said, boy, that was really rough up there, wouldn't he? He just turned around and didn't say a word, just punched him right in the mouth and knocked his two front teeth out said, you yellow bastard, you don't deserve to be <laughs> here with us. Really? The wing yeah. commander frowned on that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, for a few, a couple of incidents like that, you know, he had, <laughs> but he, um, so he, you know, it, it, it was one of these things. Our co-pilot, incidentally, was a second lieutenant when we know of, he came back as a captain. So I think Bill Brooks came back as a, as a first lieutenant, I'm not certain, but he should have been a major, you know. But, hey. He was a good leader in your eyes. Oh, he was terrific, mm -hmm. I thought, you know. I mean, he, he, was not, he was not the kind of a guy that, that the military would be thrilled with, you know, because, he, you know, he, he did things that he thought were his own. Well, it sounded working. to me also like he treated all of you, including the ground crew, mm -hmm. as equals. <clears throat> right. And that was a bit unique. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. When you talk about being up there and opening the bomb bay <clears throat> and learning yeah. to fly yeah. at high levels, yeah. what was it like? Was it cold? Was it, were you yeah. adequ adequately dressed? Oh, sure. Yeah. But, well, you have to understand, like on Guam, when we were there, like in April, May, June, uh, July, in, in that area, it was... Um, Temperature was probably like around 104 degrees. Um, and so when you'd get up at altitude, now first thing I have to tell you, one, one common thing, I told you about uh, high altitude experiences uh, out of Alamogordo, we're flying down to, uh, uh, down to Cuba and places like that. 
Well, along the way, what happened was that uh, we were always flying at altitudes that ranged from 32 to 37,000 feet. And when we got over to uh, Guam and we started flying missions, the highest altitude we ever flew at was 14,000 feet. And the reason for that was that uh, Rosie O'Donnell, God love him, they said, uh, didn't like the results he was getting from the bombing raids because they were at the high altitude. I mean, there's too many things that could affect the trajectory of the bombs and so forth. So his theory was if you fly lower, so he kept flying lower. We flew most of our missions at about 7,500 to 9,000 feet. Now, who was Rosie O'Donnell? He was the general, the commanding general of the first of the 20th Air Force. Okay. <laughs> he, has, he, <laughs> he had some really good ideas, like for example, there was another airplane that was a, an a, uh, A-20 attack bomber, and uh, they had a sign on this thing, do not open the bomb bay doors and it, it speeds in excess of 400 miles an hour. <laughs> and and how, how many miles an hour was the norm? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, that, well the pl this plane here could, could go like up to about 460 miles an hour. Okay. Not on a straight flight, but like on a dive. The idea was that this was what was known as an attack bomb. What they would do is they would take and dive down, come in level, open the bomb bay doors, right? And then they'd take and they'd skip bomb <laughs> the thing. Like they have, if, like if you had like, um, they'd have like a lot of these gun emplacements and that, they'd have them covered with all kinds of concrete to protect the people. And what they would do is they'd have like a, uh, an overhang so that you couldn't drop a bomb right directly down onto the people who were in there. So the only way you could get to them was you'd skip bomb, and they used like 100 pound GPs. And of course, then the plane would take and it drop the bomb and it would skip. And as soon as it, before the bomb hit, they would be taking off and, and trying to gain altitude. So Rosie thought, gee, this is great. Can you imagine what damage we could do if we could do that with a 500 pound bomb? So he decided he would try it on a couple of B-29s. And uh, unfortunately, we ended up losing 21 people. But <laughs> they, would, they were some other planes. They certainly, you didn't have to try to do that. No, no, But no, did you no. know the individuals that did? Oh, yeah. yeah. Was it volunteer or was it well, no. mandated it volunteer? No. Well, I mean, what, see, the, the thing is, like, there were people shooting at you, so it didn't make a hell of a lot of difference, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean. If they asked you to do these things, I mean, it was like I going to the Rikus. If we ran into a bunch of Japanese people, um, you know, what, what could you do, you know? Did everybody in your crew make it out okay? All but one. The only one that, was, was, that did make it out was our tail gunner. His name was Milt Jacobs. He was from Cleveland, Ohio. And what had happened? Well, they had, uh, one of the crews had an accident that happened, and uh, Milt Jacobs was... Uh, a tail gunner, and they asked him to fill in for this guy on a mission. And we tried to talk him out of it, but anyhow, no, he went along and he did it, and the crew got shot down and he got killed. Um, they, so we made it a ground rule. We, we would not fly with anybody again. We, the whole crew went and nobody went. You all and, stuck together. Yeah. You felt that was important. Right. And, uh, it was it was it was kind of kind of too bad. You know, we had, we you know, the 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 thing was I'd like to to say that we we didn't really didn't really I think realize the seriousness of what was taking place, because we were young, we were inexperienced, and you know it was just like, what difference does it make? Somebody's going to be shooting at you anyhow. So sure. you know. With all of that, and you had yeah. so many close calls. Did yeah. any of you get injured? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. They had, uh, we, we had, uh, with the, our closest experience that we had where we had a problem was, uh, uh, I think, I don't know, around our 22nd or 23rd mission or something, and we were um, flying a daylight mission, and uh, our bombardier was getting kind of antsy because the bombardier, I don't know if you've seen, like, in the, if you'll notice in the front of the B-29, it's all glass. And he was like right in the front. And so what would happen is he uh, decided that he would get some flak curtains 
and place them around them so that they, any flack that would come up wouldn't have, just have to go through more than the plexiglass. So, of course, what it also did was it shielded him so he couldn't see the airplanes. And somebody came from down below and t made the two planes, they made two passes, and they shot out a number four engine and a number two engine. And um, we completed our bomb run, and then we had to go back to uh, Iwo Jima, which was our fail-safe place. And we had no idea of what was taking place there, so the pilot Went, was, was on the intercom and he, oh, and he was uh, saying to the tower, um, Evo Tower, this is uh, P-39. We have two engines out. Uh, we have 1,250 gallons of fuel. We're losing 100 feet of altitude a minute. Uh, we can't maintain our airspeed. Uh, uh, please get us in the stack. Uh, please get us landing instructions. And the guy in the tower says, Roger, P-39, get in the stack. So the pilot goes back again, and he said, uh, told him a second time the same story, you know, we're losing altitude, et cetera, you know. And he said, yeah, I heard you the first time, get in the stack. And he said, uh, Iwo, Iwo Tau, this is P-39, I'm coming in. <laughs> so when he says get in the stack, does that mean get in the line or get in? Well, yeah, in they had people that were circling, circling the Circling to Well, you know, I mean, that, that's fine, but, you know, you had to, <laughs> I mean, this, this, if you're losing 100 feet a minute, you, you know, you. If you get in the stack, you're going to make three trips around, and you're going to land someplace, but you don't know where. So knowing that this was an emergency, or at least yeah. you all knew yeah. it was, yeah. was there any discussion afterwards? or There was a lot of discussion before we landed, okay. in about the uh, two and a half minutes before we landed, uh, about what the hell is the matter with these guys? Don't they realize this is an emergency? Well, when we landed there. I could understand why the guy was saying that because we landed and we're go they were going out to a ramp where they assigned us to, to park the aircraft. And as we're going along, we go by this aircraft and there's like the whole front end of the aircraft, everything from the wings forward is blown off of it. Okay? <laughs> we go by the next place, there's a, a hole in the tail that I could stand up inside of it, you know. He uh, <laughs> went to some other place and like a part of the wing is, is off the aircraft. I mean, nobody landed at Iwo unless you were in trouble. You couldn't fly, okay? So, of course. So, we, in fact, the... Yeah. Um, so, the, uh, the, the guy at the tower, I mean, you know. I the mean, tower guy was he, right, but you well, didn't I mean, know it at the time. Wh which one is the worst one? Which sure. has the worst damage that needs to go? Sort was of the like guy an better off that room. didn't have the front end on his airplane, but had four engines that were working? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and that sort of thing. So anyhow, they, we, we landed there, and we, the um, flight engineer, uh, I was the assistant flight engineer, so I go off and we started looking to see what the damage was. And then we went down to a parts depot uh, to, uh, uh, to see if we could get parts that we needed to repair the aircraft. And the, uh, the guy said, oh yeah, he's writing down all the stuff here. And I said, no. He said, well, we don't have those on hand. And I said, oh, well, we asked, when will you have them? He said, probably 90 days. So we went out and we looked and we thought, geez, this is lousy. So we went to the plane next to us, which was damaged, and we decided to take, we needed an, an oil cooler for one engine and we needed a mechanism to f feather the prop on the other engine that was out. So we went over, we all talked with, we talked with the pilot, we told him what we were gonna do, so we went over, and the, we took the, air cool, the oil cooler off of this one engine, and while they were doing that, another bunch of the guys were over on this other aircraft, and they're taking the cover off and getting the stuff ready, and they took the oil cooler off of that one, we put it on this one, we put the other one back, they buttoned up that one, and we buttoned up this one here, then we got, did the same thing to get the mechanism for the, to feather the prop on this thing. So now we go up and we tell the pilot what the situation is. The number four engine isn't going to work at all. It can look great out there, but it doesn't have, it can't do anything as far as dragging you forward or anything. So we, the pilot says, what do you think, guys? Do we want to stay here for 90 days? We said, nah. So we all got on the aircraft, and we go out, and he tells, we tell the tower that we, 
repaired the aircraft and that. And then, how, how long a period of time was that between the time you emergency oh, landed? maybe and, eight or ten hours. Wow. You know. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I know. I mean, it was a fairly decent sized job, you know. Yeah. But uh, anyhow, we, we take it. Um, so we, we, we take and we go out and we get at the end of the runway, and they have to do what's called a mag check uh, to make sure that the spark and so forth is good on the engines, and they have to take and rev up the engines. So God loves the, the flight, uh, I mean, the, uh, the flight engineer. He was, he was, uh, uh, he, he took and he had, uh, he's, he's up there and he's got them and he said to the pilot, don't you do the mag check, let me do it here. And he said, okay, so he's got a set of controls here. And he, and he, he goes through the first one and they're, you know, and of course the plane is, they rev up the engines and the plane is shaking that because you got the brakes on and so forth. And so he gets to the fourth one and he's got the prop completely feathered and he gets it going, because how can you tell, I mean, is it doing like 3,200 RPM or is it doing 39, or is it doing 4,000? So they can't see, tell, you know, it's, it's going around. So he takes the engine next to it, and he's got, got this thing going, and he's got that thing going. So the plane is, looks like he's doing a regular mag check, but it's not, it's not doing anything. So we get out to the end of the runway, and we start down the runway, and we get about halfway down the runway, and the, uh, the tower comes on, and the pilot just took his headset off, <laughs> They were telling them to, to abort the takeoff because t the number four <laughs> propeller had frozen like a cross. Oh. <laughs> and we took off. <laughs> and you knew number four wasn't working. Yeah. You took off anyway oh, just sure. to get back to Guam? Yeah. With a cross. Do you think somebody was looking out for all of you? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, yeah. No, no, we, yeah. That, it was. It was, you know, the, it was like, uh, it was like one of these things. But you know, the, the things, the stories I'm telling you, this is, this is not like something like, oh yeah, geez, these guys really were, I mean, it's not like Hogan's Heroes, you know, like sure. we got six guys. I mean, you know, you're talking about 400 planes yeah. and probably 400 crews who all have like similar type of, of anecdotes they can tell you sure. about, you know? Sure. And uh, it's, it was, it was kind of funny. I mean, you know, the, the people, if, if they didn't make fun of everything, it would be, it would be kind of too bad, you know? Like we had, I, I, we had some funny incidents that occurred, you know, like for example, we had, uh, we had one, one of the uh, flight engineers in, in the cruise was, was a man who was like, well, our flight engineer was 41 also, but this guy was 41 years old. But he was like kind of a career military man. And he had been a, uh, a Marine sergeant uh, and before the war started and so forth. And he had had a tour of duty uh, in Guam, because there was a naval base there, you know, and he was at the naval base. So, you know, we have these movies that were out. So obviously the Guam people would take and come to sit and watch the movies and the, with the kids, you know, and all this stuff here. So. We spotted this lady with uh, about seven kids going into, into the movies. And so we looked and we, this guy kept telling us all about all these stories about things that went on in Guam, you know, and so forth when he was there as a Marine. So we go over to this lady and we ask her how much would she take to have for her to go over and have she and her kids go over and grab this guy <laughs> and start calling him daddy. <laughs> so, so anyhow, we, we agreed on a price, and it, was, it wasn't money. They were looking more like for food or what have you. So anyhow, told them that if she, they come back later, we would take care of all of this. And we gave them some money, too, so they could buy something if they, I don't know what the hell they'd spend it on. But anyway, so they, all of a sudden, you go and they have this, and she goes, when they go, and she says, sweetheart, she throws her arms around the guy's neck, and the kids are like, daddy. Oh, my God. <laughs> And I you're all this, standing there <laughs> laughing, I'm oh, sure. Oh, yeah, and I thought this guy was going to kill Well, luckily, he couldn't get a hold of any of us. We had to run faster than he could. But, <laughs> but I mean, they, you know, they did, they did like things like that. There were a lot of incidents, you know, like the people did things like that, you know. Um, when you um, were in Guam yeah. and you knew something was going on with the Enola Gay, yeah. um, how... How did you, did you hear about the progress of the war in the Pacific? Because you were saying yeah. Germany basically was done. Well, we, we were trying, eventually, <clears throat> one of the things was when we, we got done, we did not, um, 
the guys were trying not to fly missions, and they, I, and I don't mean that, that the pilots were refusing to go or anything like this here. It was like the, the commanders, like the wing commanders, mm -hmm. would, would, didn't want to fly a mission unless they had to. And after the first bo atom bomb was dropped, we didn't do anything for like seven days. And uh, five to seven days, I'm not sure if it was five or seven, but it was a, a, lo a longer period of time than happened. And then they eventually decided that what they wanted to do was to, uh, uh, to, to uh, show them that we really meant business. So they had a massive raid. They went out, we went out to, I think it was like four different Japanese cities, and they bombed the daylights out of them, you know. And um, then we came back, and then they had the, I think like a week later, they had the, the second atom bomb that was dropped. And um, then after that, the, you know, the Japanese, they, the emperor presented his sword or something, you know, that the, the war was over. <coughs> were and, you part of, at the end of the war, when they were doing any of the signing, were you around for that? No, no, we were, no, we, we were no place near that. I, mm -hmm. I used to work for a man who was um, the adjutant for um, the general who signed the, the peace treaty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so he witnessed it? Yeah, yes, he was. Yeah, mm -hmm. he did. Um, but the, the uh, it, it, it was kind of funny, you know, because we, we were feeling kind of strange. Now, one of the one of the crazy things that happened along the way was that um, <coughs> our our aircraft, <coughs> our plane, was supposed to go on a big war bond drive after the war was over. Um, I With think your that, crew? Yeah. <laughs> I think our, our pilot caused us to be replaced <laughs> because they didn't know what in hell they could do. They sure in hell couldn't give them like a double promotion or something. Uh, you know, you know, uh, they didn't want to give them even one. So um, we, we were, were coming back, we flew back to the States and we were supposed to go home for, I don't know, 15 days or something and then come back and we were gonna go around to different places so people could, you know, go through the thing and we would be kind of like, you know, tour guides, you know. But they had, you know, it was like they decided they replaced us with another crew and uh, which was fine with us, you know. But one of the other interesting things was that our ground crew chief uh, <laughs> became a fifth gunner. <laughs> really? Yeah. He had been there for, I think, like maybe 42, 44 months on Guam. And they were going to take, and you know, he, was, he could be discharged immediately. He had, had enough points for, for only two people to get discharged, you know. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the point system, you know, like you had to have so many points in order to get discharged. Other than that, you had to stay in the military mm -hmm. after the war. You know? so, <clears throat> so when we were flying back, we, <laughs> he wanted to, to go back. If he could get back to the States, he could immediately get discharged. And I don't know whether he had a good job to go to or what. But anyhow, <laughs> the pilot de <laughs> decided that we created a fifth gunner's position on, on the crew. And the guy flew with us, and and he and he we flew him. He flew back to the states with us. And Where did you fly into? We flew back in we, Bakersfield, California, I believe it was. Yeah, and then um, then he, you know, we we dropped the air, aircraft there, and then we went off. We were off like on on 15 days leave or something, and um, and it just just never materialized. So then we got transferred by military convoy or whatever the hell it is, or by train and, and so forth, to go across the country. Uh, and we ended up uh, over at Fort Devens. And at that point, I was given a 30 days rehabilitation leave. And they yeah. called it a rehabilitation leave yeah. because of your being uh, in combat? Yeah, well, it was, I think they were just, just trying to be nice to us, you know. Um, 
But in any event, you know, we, we did this. And, uh, and after your leave, how long did you have to stay in before you got discharged? I think five days. Five days. <laughs> so five days yeah. later, you were discharged. And what I was think your some, something like, it was something like, it was a very short time. And what and was your rank when you were discharged? Staff sergeant. They had, uh, they, you know, if we had, uh, the, you know, to be honest with you, you know, it was like one of those situations where we had um, really, uh, if we had to go to war, it was, it was like uh, you couldn't have been in a better place, you know. It just, when you were discharged, you were given some commendations. Would you oh, like yes. to show some of those oh, yeah. to well, the audience? Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> you could hold this it up right. Is, this, is, this is the one that you always see on MASH, the Good Conduct Medal. You know, that means you didn't get, get thrown in the pokey for, for a year or something, mm -hmm. and, you know. <laughs> they don't give you any oak leaf pluses for that, though, so once you get it, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> This was the air medal, and um, I had uh, the, the air medal, and I think it was two oak leaf clusters on it. Um, and that was like if you flew five missions or six, ten missions or some amount of missions, uh, you, you got this, um, this, this medal, and then for every time you duplicated that feat, you, you got an oak leaf cluster, and it was supposed, if you had a ribbon, as this is like a, a button here that, sure. that goes in, but if you had like the uh, ribbon that they wear on the, on the military uniform, you would have the oak leaf cluster on, I don't think there's one there, no, there isn't. And how many uh, missions again did you fly total? 27. 27? Yeah. And what is this okay. other? And this one here is the, is a distinguished flying cross. And, and one of the missions that we flew, um, there were, um, we were flying, there was a, uh, Two planes that uh, attacked a submarine, American submarine, and uh, <laughs> we went over and and uh, fought the planes. <laughs> and so, the captain of the submarine um, wrote a uh, a letter and uh, and a commendation for us about for doing this stuff here, and we were given the given a distinguished flying cross for that. That's wonderful. Yeah. Could you also show, in case yeah. you were shot down, yeah. some of the information yeah. which we found a bit fascinating and yeah. what it's made of? Well, this is a, uh, the instruction sheet that they gave us. Um, I don't think anybody's going to be able to read it, but anyhow. Um, if you were shot down, what yeah. to do? Yes. When you, when you landed, you know, you had, because you're flying over water, you had to have, just like the, air, the airlines, you know, you had to wear... Um, this, you had this vest that you put on so you could float, and if you're lucky, you might have had also had a, uh, <clears throat> a raft, a life raft or something. And it was directions on how to navigate and how to get to the different places. And obviously, paper would not be very good, and as you can see, this is like the silk material, mm -hmm. okay? Yes. And um, this is, was in the, the pouch, every uh, air person uh, had had uh, received a pouch with all of this material in it, and you you know you you'd get this, and then um, we had this was a map of uh, that one map in case you got uh, um, got shot down so so you could take and find your things, and this was. I can see it says the Yellow Sea, Po yeah. Hai, yeah. so it's China. Yeah in case yeah. of being shot yeah. down. And that's also made of silk. Yeah. And then the back On is... On the back is another, another map, okay? Yeah, the South China Sea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, the, the, the main idea was so that, to try and give you an opportunity to get back to someplace. Um, realistically, uh, what, what happened in most of the cases is that uh, the... Uh, um, if you got shot down and you were close to the Japanese coast, before you could, I mean, you had like hundreds of miles to go before you were going to be any place that would be safe. And so you had to take and uh, uh, your chances of not being taken as a prisoner were, were pretty remote. But it was good to have these things and, they, and, they, and some people did use them and did, were able to, to survive them. 
And that's one of the reasons why, like, you know, like when we would, you remember we were talking about like fail-safe places like the, going to Iwo. Yes. Um, you try to get close to Okinawa. Um, or to any island or any place that you could go. You went as far as you could. <laughs> and then you tried to get so you could get as far away from the uh, uh, Japanese mainland as you, uh, or coastline as you could, because then you had a better chance of surviving if you did it. What was it like after um, all of this adventure yeah. and danger? Yeah. What was it like for you? What was it, your feelings about coming home? Oh. Well, I, I thought it was. I thought it was. Uh, it was. It was really great for me. I mean, I was very fortunate. Uh, I have a, only one brother who's who is like uh, 14 years younger than I am, and of course, he thought I was the greatest thing since sliced bread. You know, maybe better than sliced bread, but you know. But any, you know, and when I came home, um, he was uh, like seven years old, or eight years old. And he, he thought it was great. He loved being dressed up like in a, in a uniform, you know. And, Did uh, you talk at all about or discuss about any of the missions you were on when you got home? Not, not, not really. Um, you, you know, it's, it's, kind, it's kind, of, kind, of, uh, kind of funny because we, we tried not to, not to dwell on things that were, were really bad. Um, you know, some of the things that, that I came away from, from Guam was, you know, while we were there at Guam, we had, uh, uh, we had a, a chaplain <laughs> who had a, uh, um, had, a, had a chapel, you know, with like a tent with, you know, with wooden floors and so forth. And I went to Mass one day there, one Sunday, and, uh, and I was amazed because they had, the most gorgeous, most intricately carved railing. In Guam. And I said, in Guam. Mm -hmm. It was like a part of it, it was like a section, like maybe like eight feet or something like this. And what it was, was one of the uh, pilots, his hobby was carving stuff, and he had carved this, this thing. I, I'm sitting there looking at it, it's just, just absolutely gorgeous. I'm thinking to myself, you know, that must be pretty good. And I got to got to talk with the with, with the chaplain, and we became um, pretty friendly. And and strange it may seem, I, I became more religious there than than what I was when I went over. And has that continued? Yes, it has. Yeah. Did yeah. you join any unit of the military reserve when you came back? No, I did not. I what I did do was so I was active in the uh, uh, in the American Legion, and. Um, and also, I try to do. I work with a there's a uh, paraplegic uh, veterans group up in Wilton, New Hampshire. Um, uh, everybody that belongs to that one is is a paraplegic or a quadriplegic. You have to be at least a paraplegic, I think. And they they have a home up there, I think, for some of the for these some of these people to live and so forth. So I try to do some stuff with them. Um, have you received any veterans benefits such as the GI Bill insurance? Yes, I did. Did you use it yeah. to go back to school? Yes, I did. And did you go back to BC? I did. And what what year did you graduate? Uh, well, I I graduated. I was actually in the. I graduated in August of 1948, but I had to wait until June of 1949 to get my my degree. Um, but I all my I didn't attend school at all for that in. Uh, September to June of 1949. And then what did you do as a career? Well, uh, along the way, uh, I kind of liked school, so I decided I would try being a career student, but it didn't work out too well. Um, they, uh, along the way, I, had, uh, uh, I went to BC, had opened up a, uh, uh, a master's program or a graduate degree program, and the uh, priest who was in charge of it was uh, Father W. C. V. Joyce. Um, you may have heard of him, uh, and and W. C. V. Joyce was was a great man, and he had and uh, I was in one of the first groups that went there. I never did get a master's degree. I had like all of the credits, but I never did 
to go over to, to, to do my thesis or anything. So I, I did do the thesis, but I didn't turn it in. I did do the exams, the orals. So um, from there, I, uh, I, had, I had started out after doing that. I, I was looking around for work. I had to get a job because I had gotten married in the meantime, and my wife was pregnant, and uh, our oldest son got born, and, and I figured, well, I can't live off of her anymore, so I have to. So I have to go out and get a job. So um, that meant I had to get a regular full-time job. Not, usually what I did is I worked like about 20 hours a week, plus I had the GI Bill, and we were doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. So I went on, and I was with uh, several other people at BC, and we all tried to uh, get attached as, um, um, used to be able to get a thing that was known as a, uh, um, I keep wanting to say assistant professor, but it's not that. It's lower than that. It was like it was an like instructor. Like a fellowship. Was yeah, right. Yeah, and it was we were like an instructor for them. And what they did is they allowed you to complete your masters and your PhD, and you taught twelve hours a semester, and uh, you uh, also got free tuition and so forth. And for doing the twelve hours, I was admitted to Syracuse University, and. Uh, I thought I was going to go to a, um, oh God, my memory's slipping on it, uh, going up to Syracuse, and there was a, a small Catholic university that went there, and I was, they wanted me to teach there, and they would pay my tuition. They made an agreement so I could go to Syracuse to finish my uh, master's and so forth. So two other people that were students at BC went with me, went up there, and I, unfortunately or unfortunately, had gone to work for the telephone company, and uh, I had to make a decision whether I wanted to stay with the telephone company or go up there. So we, I decided to stay with them, and uh, and I did, and and um, and then I worked there. I don't know twenty eight years, I guess, and. I was doing rape cases, and, I de and one of the lawyers said to me, geez, it's too bad you're not a lawyer. So I decided I would go to law school. And how old were you went to, when you went to law school? 47. And where did you go? To, uh, New England School of Law. And then did you practice law? Oh, yes. That's, so I re what happened was I, I, had, I tried to get transferred into the legal department at the telephone company, and they politely told me they don't transfer people, so they, so I decided when I got to be 55, I retired from the telephone company and went into law practice, private practice of law. And are you still in practice? I am. <laughs> Do you attend any reunions of your old outfit? No. Uh, I had, I, that's what, when, when we started out, um, I know most of the people who go to these reunions, believe it or not, most of the people who go there are, are like from the uh, infantry. They, they had such close friendships that they, you know, they just really go ahead and do it. We're very close with the, with the people, but like in, like in our case, like, like our, our crew would be difficult to have a reunion because a pilot was from Portland, I was from uh, the Lowell area. Um, uh, one of the gunners was from um, Pennsylvania, Latrobe, Pennsylvania, very famous, Arnold Palmer. <laughs> and he works at the golf course down there. Uh, I should have kept up, uh, kept, uh, kept friendly up with him. him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we had uh, another one, uh, Top Gunner was from um, uh, Indiana. Uh, and uh, uh, the re replacement tail gunner we had was from someplace in Texas. Um, have you seen any of them? Uh, no, I have. To be honest with you, they haven't because, like we, you know, at the time, like I, you know, we didn't. I didn't have any money to sure. to, to yeah. go traveling around, yeah. and uh, we had. Uh, but the, we, you know, we have. Uh, you know, we had communicated, you know, talk back and forth and, and stuff like that, but it, it was really difficult for everybody because, like, when we came home, <coughs> like, you know, like, the GI Bill, like, they used to pay, um, I think it was, like, 
while I was married, and I got $105 a month. <coughs> so I used to work like 20 hours a couple of nights a week on Saturdays, and, uh, and I used to get a magnificent uh, payment of, uh, for the, uh, let's see, eight, 16 hours, eight, 16 hours, I think I used to get $15 or something like that. How so. important to you was serving in the military, and do you feel in any way that it affected your life? Well, believe it or not, the person it had the biggest effect on was my brother, who went to Norwich and retired as a, a colonel. Really? <laughs> he kind yeah. of wanted to follow in your footsteps? No, I mean, he, he went over and he did, he did this stuff, you know. He, he, went, he went to Norwich and he had, uh, you know, I, you know, he, he came out and, and he got married and he, and he was a colonel, like I say. And, but anyhow, he, you know, it affected him. It, it did have an effect on me because one of the things that uh, along the way that I, I came up was finally finding out that um, I think war is a stupid solution to any argument. Why do you say that? Well, you know, when, when we, my wife and I were able to, to do our first trip, we had been married like 20 years, and she, the one thing that she wanted to do was to go to Ireland. So I said, oh, okay. So we went to Ireland, and we decided she's, her father's people came from uh, the north of Ireland. And um, so she said, geez, I'd love to go and visit my father's birthplace, you know, and so forth, or his family's. So there's a little place called Castle Pollard. And so we went. We, decided we would try to go there. We went, we went to Ireland I, five times, I think, or something. Anyhow, so one, one of the trips we decided we would go up to the north as well. We planned three days up there. And I got up there and I started looking at, at some of the things that happened. Like, for example, we were going into the north through a town called Derry, London Derry. They, so what, what happens is you take and you go into the town and you stop at a, an inspection point. They go all through your car, through the trunk, you know, under the mirrors underneath, you know, and all this stuff here. 200 yards down the road, you, you got to turn left to go over a bridge. They have another checkpoint because there could be cars coming from the other way. So we go through the checkpoint again. Now we go across the bridge on this river, and there's nothing but water on either side of you. There's a checkpoint here. You get to the end of the bridge, you go through still another checkpoint, and you get to get off, you go through two more. So we leave this thing, and we drive like about 40 miles, and we come to this town, and my wife said, oh, we gotta get some cold cuts or something. I said, okay, so we, I figure I'm gonna drive into town. So we go through the checkpoint. What are you coming into town for? And I said, well, we wanted to get some supplies. Oh, okay. Park over there in the grocery stores over there. So man gets that man that's with us gets out of the car, goes into the tobacco shop, comes out with a newspaper. They stopped us again. They went all through the Garmium car again. And every place that you stopped, everybody was petrified because they thought that the British soldiers were going to come over and blow up the car or what have you. And we were at a, in, in a um, place called Porterdown, and they had, when we came up to this rotary traffic, and we needed to go like on the first road to the right, and it was like the sixth house down on the left. They wouldn't let us go down that road. I have no idea why. We had to take and go around. It was like 11 miles to come, back, come up the other way to come into this thing. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, this is crazy. What so, years were these that this was happening? Oh, this was, um, let's see. We got married in 48. It should be about 68, 69, 70 in that area. And, and, and I started looking at the things, and, I, and, I, and like, for example, like one of the things, we were stopped in traffic one time, and a, and a man had a, an old Magneto car, and, which, you know, I don't, if you're not familiar with it, like Magneto car, like if, you, if you're running the engine and you race the engine, you could take and turn the Magnetos off, and it'll backfire, and you turn it back on, the car will start right up again. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a dieseling effect or something mm -hmm. in a non-diesel engine. So <clears throat> this guy goes over, and he's racing the engine, and he does that. 
And there's, with, beside us is a weapons carrier with a guy with a 50 caliber machine gun on it, Travis, and a guy sitting with a submachine gun inside, right? And so after it pops two or three times, see the door open and, and, he's, and out comes the submachine gun and I'm saying, let's see, if I right in the line of fire here? No. So anyway, they take and, and the guy looks and he f sees the guy there and he's shaking his fist at the guy. The sidewalks are filled with people and they're all sitting there laughing like hell and I'm saying to myself, what are these British soldiers accomplishing here? Now at least those guys could take and put on a sport coat or something and, you know, go off and they could mingle and they at least look somewhat like the, po the general population. Was it that, at this point, we were like in Vietnam? And I'm sitting there thinking, what the hell are our guys doing? I mean, how, how can they possibly live? I mean, it's, it's I don't know, it, it just seemed to me like such a ridiculous thing. And I haven't seen any, anything, any wars that have gone on since then. I don't mean that the people, the guys that are fighting them aren't brave and they're not doing marvelous things, but it's just such a stupid thing, way to do it, and when you could perhaps try to negotiate something, you know? But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Do you feel that way also about World War II, or do you feel that it was important no. for you to be involved? Well, no, I mean, the, the difference to me between like World War I and World War II is you had, as you probably know, like in, the English did not do anything until, uh, until Adolf was threatening them. Uh, people in France didn't, weren't looking to do anything. And maybe that was a mistake. I, I don't know whether it is or it isn't, but anyhow. But it was as a result of his doing something like this. And as you know, we didn't jump in the war until the Japanese created Pearl Harbor. And so, I mean, you know, like, I mean, I'm not saying that, the, you know, like if somebody came along and punched you in the nose that you should just stand there and say, okay, try it again. But what I'm saying is if somebody punched me in the nose, I mean, I might punch him back, but it's, it's, I mean, that's not what we're doing like in a lot of these circumstances, you know. It's, it, it just seems to me nonsensical to, you know. Is there anything else you'd like to leave us with? Well, with this wonderful interview today. Yeah, well, you know, the, the one thing is that I do think there's nothing wrong with, I mean, I think it's a great career, and I do think some of the most honorable people you could ever meet are in the military. Uh, they, you know, if you, like, for example, like I, I talked a lot about, about how, how bad it was, like, in the, in the infantry and so forth, but I want to tell you that the people in the, the, these people that are in the infantry, I could take and leave a thousand dollars sitting on my bunk in, in, the, in the military and nobody would even touch it. There's honesty there also. There's integrity and so forth. I mean, it just, I mean, and, and I think that, that there's a lot to be gained from that. I mean, you know, you, I think like one of the other things is you, you need to know that there are rules and regulations and you do have to follow them. Um, like, like I get indignant like right now, you know, um, there's a lot of people who show disrespect for the law. Now obviously, you know, at 47 years old, I, I, when I went to law school, I'm going there because I, I must have some feeling for it. And I sit there and I see people who come in and they, they, uh, they get newspapers, they get their, their breakfast with them. They're sitting there in the courtroom. They got their hat on. They don't know enough to take off their hat in, in there, you know, and uh, you know it just it just this this seems to be such a, a lot of disrespect for, you know, policies. I'm not saying that everything that we ever did was right, but it just just seemed to me that what we need to do is to is to have some people have some respect for for the I items that we do. Well, Joseph C. Peruti, we yeah. want to thank yeah. you for yeah. sharing your yeah. memories yeah. about your yeah. branch of service mm -hmm. and your service to our country. We want to thank you again thank for you participating. Thank you very much for having me. I'm okay. delighted to be here. Thanks.